Frank, the universe looks pretty normal to me. I appreciate your hospitality and your home here. I see your books, they look great, and the couch sitting here, pretty tie you're wearing. Why do you say the universe is a strange place? Well, when you try to do justice to uh, accurate observations of the universe and the uh, peculiar phenomena we, we find, uh, you find when you dig deeper, when you try to look at the basic uh, behavior of, of the most elementary parts of matter, that to do justice to that, you have to go far, far away from familiar realities and start to invoke concepts like quantum fields and indeterminism and fluctuations and broken symmetry. And the universe seems very, very strange. It's very different from familiar concepts. You have to unlearn everything you thought you know, and then come back to understand how this very unfamiliar set of concepts also describes the world you think you knew and that you live in. But these are not just um, models of the way you have to think about it. You're saying that this strangeness is the real reality? It's real in the sense that uh, it allows us to understand everything. I mean, everything that we can understand, <laughs> that, uh, that we manage to understand, and that's a lot. Uh, so uh, although you can't explain the strange aspects of the universe in terms of familiar ones, you can explain the familiar ones in terms of the strange ones. So in that sense, it's the deeper understanding, the deeper reality. On the other hand, it, it, because it is explaining things about the universe, it makes us, some things seem less strange, hmm. or things that should have seemed strange to people. Uh, now we understand them in a profound way. For instance, an outstanding example, for instance, is the abundance of different chemical elements. For a hundred years ago, uh, basically since people discovered the chemical elements, they thought they uh, originally that one couldn't change into another and you had all these entries in the periodic table, you know, 90 or more than a hundred, depending on what you include. Uh, the, that, were just there. They couldn't, by definition, they're elements, they couldn't change one into the other. Alchemy never worked. <laughs> Alchemy never worked. Uh, and the ratios were quite peculiar. Uh, and, and when people found out ways of figuring out what the, the chemical uh, structure of stars was, they found quite different ratios than what it is here and why. And so all this was extremely mysterious. People had no idea that it could even be addressed scientifically. If they, if they don't change, well, you're just stuck with them. It was that way forever. You'd have to appeal to God or initial conditions, which amounts to the same thing. Right? <laughs> uh, but now we do understand it. We understand that the different forms of matter are largely intraconvertible to each other. There are interactions which in the present state of the universe are very weak or very hard to discover experimentally, but now we know about them and in extreme conditions they can become more powerful where different elements do change into each other. Like in the center of stars. In the center of stars or in the very early universe in the mm -hmm. early moments of the Big Bang. And you can calculate, you can calculate in the, during the Big Bang how much of the different kinds of elements would be produced, how many, how the different protons and neutrons would stick together. And then you can understand, and you can also calculate the evolution of stars. It calls on a vast variety of physical laws, but you can put them all together, solve the equations, and figure out how stars work, and how the different elements are cooked one into the other inside stars. They blow and, up and they give and they their up and, yeah, and elements liberate to the their world. elements. That's right. And, and we absorb and them in get our bodies. Right. And by following this process quantitatively, you get a remarkable, remarkably detailed account of why 
hydrogen is the most abundant, then helium is less abundant, and then other things are much rarer in the universe. But you can calculate different abundances, and iron is especially abundant, but compared to other things, and we can understand that on the basics of basic physical laws. So here we have an example of where the universe was a strange place, and was, then through science we'd be able, we were able to show how it makes sense. Now It's really comprehensible, right? That's maybe the most the deepest, most fundamental lesson of physics is that the universe really is comprehensible in terms of definite mathematical laws. Now, one of the most remarkable and certainly strangest ideas that I've heard is about mass, things that we think we are, <laughs> and this yes. seems so obvious. But you make the remarkable statement that we can talk about matter and we don't even need to deal with mass too much. That's right. In modern physics, mass is a very secondary uh, consequence. The, and you got to help me <laughs> understand that. <laughs> well, people once thought, and this was a basic tenet of Newton's physics and Lavoisier's chemistry, was that is that mass is conserved. Mass was almost the definition of matter. Right. Matter is something that has mass. That's what matter is. But in the 20th century, it's really a 20th century development, uh, we learn that energy is really more basic than mass. It's really energy that's conserved, as far as we can tell, not mass. Mass can come and go, but energy is rigorously conserved. And that's Einstein's it's, equation, E equals mc squared. E equals mc squared. Yeah, and, <laughs> that, and so energy can, so you can get mass from energy by going to Einstein's second law, which is m equals e divided by c squared. You can get mass from energy as well as, well as energy from mass. Uh, in Einstein's original paper, he said, he posed a question. The title of the paper was a question. was, Does the inertia of a body depend on its energy content? That is, can you explain inertia, mass, in terms of the energy of the stuff inside? And uh, we've learned that the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Not only does it depend on it, but quantitatively, that's almost all the mass of ordinary matter. So all the mass, almost, almost all, almost all the all. mass, ninety-five percent, maybe ninety-eight percent. So here's your proton. <laughs> okay, let's take a look. <laughs> With three quarks of different colors, that's what they look like, and <laughs> gluon tubes holding them together. So, so the the, the whole thing is the, is the proton, yes. which is just one proton in, in a one. nucleus of an atom here floating by itself. Yeah. So this would be a hydrogen nucleus, <laughs> right. if you like a proton. Okay. Okay. Uh, so three different quarks and that of different those, colors and bound three together. Quarks compose the proton in some strange yeah, way. together with the gluons. The gluons. This is a <laughs> very schematic, schematic, yeah. <laughs> sketchy part of yeah. one part of the wave function of a proton. There are other parts that have additional quarks and anti-quarks mm -hmm. and maybe stray gluons floating around. But this is the common core that mm. that's always there. And uh, if you look analyze what goes into this, mm. uh, the quarks have almost no mass. Their mass is much less than 1% the mass of, of the proton. The gluons have rigorously zero mass. And the mass of the proton comes around from, comes from the motion of these guys. That's incredible. Sort of the, you say the it so in the field. normally. Yeah, as though yes. it's a normal understanding. But the mass of the proton that we people in the past thought was something solid and permanent right. and Im immobile in every possible way <laughs> and forever, right. from, from everlasting to everlasting. And now you're saying that the vast majority of its, of its mass is it doesn't exist, but it's just the e the energy, the well, fluctuations. Well, it's not a primary property. It's the secondary consequence as a of result the of the, of the energy of the movement of th those things. So it's right. not that the the weight of the proton you just sum up the weight of those three. No, masses. not at all. Well, if you summed up the masses of yeah. those, you get practically you get only one percent or two percent of the mass of the proton. Wow! And the rest is the rest is energy divided by c squared wow. <laughs> to make mass. And it's the energy of all that stuff kind of boiling and not boiling in a literal sense, but moving and interacting and yes. doing all sorts right. of things. So we really are, in a sense, creatures of light. We, we uh, are yeah. made of things that don't 
way anything. Be right. frank, before you uh, put that down, why don't you tell me a little bit about the other side of that um, little display, which appears to be uh, written in Swedish. Yeah, it is written in Swedish. I don't know exactly what it says. There are little things I do understand. There's my name. It is Nobel Pris. I means Nobel Prize, I believe. Yeah, I think this, this is the certificate, certificate think, that came with the Nobel Prize. I yeah. think that's the only two things you really need to know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you.